Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for coming today on a rainy day. Uh, but this is our first event of the semester, so we're very excited to have a full house. My name is Dionisia Ramos. I'm the vice chair here at the Center for Latin American Studies. So I'd like to welcome you all to our talk today, which is actually the first talk in our series, our Bay Area Latin America series. Um, and we've been very fortunate to have Marta Machado with us as a visiting scholar since October, and unfortunately she's leaving at the end of this month, so we wanted to make sure we got her in before she left. Uh, she is a professor of law at the Fundación Getulio Vargas in Sao Paulo, and she'll be talking today about a 2006 statute um, against domestic violence and gender violence. And so I really want to thank Marta for talking to us today, so please join me in wel welcoming her. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to really thank uh, Janicia and Professor um, Shaikin and the class for receiving me here. I really have a wonderful uh, stay here in Berkeley and it was really great for my work. And I really want to thank everybody of this, for this wonderful welcome stay and all the staff. And uh, I also would like to apologize my broken English. I'll have this lecture will be in an official broken English. So <laughs> uh, if you have, if if it's not, if I can't find a word in English, I'll try uh, Spanish, Portuguese. If you can help me, it would be wonderful. And uh, and I also talk about. I don't know. I I'll, I'll, I'll have a lot of juridical aspects to talk about. So if not everybody are, are from the law field, please make questions. When, whatever, whenever I'm not clear, you please interrupt me. And I'll be glad if I can be as clear as possible. Um, I've been, uh, originally I come from, I studied criminal law. And I've been studying uh, criminal law uh, for in criminal law field and criminal law aspect for um, 10 years since I, I, I had my degree. I started my PhD and everything was focused on criminal law. And I started, um, and especially the movement towards that you know very well, towards increase of criminalization, increase of incarceration and everything. We are going through all of this in Brazil very, all this movement in Brazil very strongly, like uh, criminal law being used very strongly by, uh, in political campaigns, and it's, it's more or less in the center of discussion, in the political discussion uh, nowadays in Brazil. And what was really triggering me, or what I thought was really interesting, was to see how social movement that was supposed to, supposedly to be very progressist and very open and defend civil rights and liberties and everything, was, had a very conservative position when it comes to criminal law, when it comes to incarceration. So I started to study uh, social movement from this uh, worry, general worry about incarceration. I went to, I started like since 2006, to study how social movements were in Brazil were so attached to incarceration and demand, and whenever they made demands towards the law, it was a dem demand for more criminal law and more incarceration. And I developed a study on the black movement, the black Brazilian movement that was organized in 60, since the, the 50s and all the demands towards the law and towards anti-racism measures was we want more criminal law, we want more, we want to increase the penalties uh, and we want incar more incarceration for the abusers and so on and so forth. And then I came to, uh, to the gender movement, uh, especially in the moment, and I started, started studi studying the gender movements, especially in the moment of this law, it was the most important law to address domestic violence in Brazil. And the whole debate about the, this law was exactly, and it's a very modern law, we'll talk about it, but the most important question for the feminists, for the Brazilian feminists were, uh, 
we want incarceration. We don't want alternative measures. We want all the alternative measures that we had, in a way, to address criminal matters. We want. We don't want this to be a, to be uh, to be applied to domestic violence. So the whole process, and it was a very, it was two years of process of discussing this law, was about. We want to get rid of the alternatives to incarceration in the cases of uh, domestic violence. And it was a very strong, strong part of the movement towards more criminal law, more incarceration. And we, are vi if we have been facing a lot of problems uh, in the enforcement of this law, exactly because of that. I mean, we have a great resistance from uh, judges uh, to apply this law, I have a great question. There are many movement. There, there is a movement of questioning the constitutionality of this law, exactly because of this aspect. And that's that's why I came to the gender study. So, I'm not a specialist in the, in gender. So, I think maybe the dialogue is is been very interesting with the with gender studies has been very very interesting to me. And I think uh, I have a lot of a lot to learn to, with the, the feminist studies. Uh, and I'm just, I, I'm in this period here, I was, um, I'm really starting this new agenda of the research. So any insights, any, anything, and impressions, everything you have to, to say, it's very, it's very welcome. So what, what I prepared today, it's a general panorama of, uh, what, what is this law, how it, it has been uh, enacted, and what, what is the situation now in Brazil regarding its enforcement. Uh, well, we have, first of all, a very... Um, a great problem with construction of data in Brazil, with numbers. So it's very, very difficult to bring numbers to you. I was like, every, every, every time I go to, a, a, to see a talk here, you have a lot of numbers to show, you have a lot of research to show. I couldn't do much because we are really starting to have research, comprehensive research in this area. And regarding gender and domestic violence, it's even worse because there are m much cases that are just not reported. So it, it's, re it's really difficult to to get in touch to the problem through numbers. So what I, what I have here is what we have as the most comprehensive studies, and it brings like this kind of data. Like what I can say is that domestic violence is a very, it's a, it's a very relevant problem in Brazil. And what we have is like these two research that shows that many women have been uh, affected by, by it, like 130 uh, in this research, the first one, 2001, one third of Brazilian women admitted to have suffered physical violence, uh, and they are almost by husbands, partners, and so on. And the most common, the most common cases are physical aggressions, threats, and rape committed by partners. Uh, but I mean, this, these numbers, again, it's just approximative. I just would like to, to, um, to make the point that it's, it's, re it's a serious problem in Brazil. Uh, this is a very, very brief scenario of the organization of the, of the feminist movement. I don't know if you can read. But I mean, the, it's, it's, it's very recent, in the 70s, it began to organize itself in the 70s. And, and it took advantage of the process of democratization of the country. So it was like the general social mobilization for democracy. We were in dictatorship until the 80s. So the general, the, the, the social, the gender movement took advantage of, of, of this social movementation towards democracy. And the international inputs were always very important. So the conference, the, the conference in Mexico City of 1975 was, was also uh, important to help to organize 
the movement in a in a and center its agenda in the in the gender question. And Sao Paulo was was a very in Sao Paulo was the most strong uh, mobilization. So in uh, in the eighties we had uh, the first Council of Women's Rights that was a state council in Sao Paulo, and also in the eighties we the first uh, specialized police station for women that was also in Sao Paulo, and we had a decade. The eighties were more or less the, the the agenda of the of the social movement was. Uh, was the creation of these specialized uh, police stations because it was it was and it's still a problem uh, how women are treated when they get to to the police station after being battered. So it was we say the eighties in Brazil were the the decade of the specialized police station, but it really grew very slowly and. And most in the capitals, like in general, what we still have, it's a very uneven politic of of creation of organs because it's a it's a huge country and it's and and although okay, I'm talking about now. Although the federal government is very is very involved in the in the in creating a gender politics, it depends on state structures and city structures that it's really it's really getting the thing. Um, very, very slow. Uh, international scenario was was very important. Like again, the the two Brazil um, signed the two conferences, the UN Declaration, the Inter American Convention. Convention. The Inter American Convention was even more important because it was in Brazil. It was in Belém do Pará, so it was. It gave more repercussion, and it was give. It, it really gave. Power to the to the movement to put the question in the national politic politic agenda. And what was very very important was that's why the the, the, the law is named after this case Maria da Penha was uh, a condemnation of Brazil by the Inter American Commission uh, of Human Rights of from the organization of the organization of American states. It was a case that this woman, she was paraplegic after being, uh, after suffering many abuses. She was, she was, uh, she, there was two, two times attempting homicide and she ended up paraplegic. And she was doing, uh, during the, the abuses, she was trying to, to search help and nothing happened and the case to, and it took 20 years to have a sentence from about this uh, very serious um, aggression. So the case took simply 20 years. It took simply 20 years to to this man or to this woman find a sentence. And then uh, some NGO sent the case to the to the. Um, Inter-American Commission and Brazil was condemned to uh, for negligence and, uh, and omission in the case, in the case, and it was uh, highly recommended to get to find more efficient ways to combat domestic, combat domestic violence. And this was uh, directly, this has had a, a very important effect in uh, mobilizing the national movement. So in 2000, then it started, we started to have these national conferences of women. And it was really important to civil society. It was really, uh, it was really a shift in the mobilization of, of civil society. Like any, many NGOs were, were starting to, to get organized. And the conferences were really a space, and, and really a space that Demands were were constructed and discussed, and they discussed um, in 2002. Uh, we had elections in Brazil, and they discussed a, a feminist platform to present to the to the candidates. And 2004 was the peak of the of the movement, and they were more organized. 
there were more people involved. The government was really making a, a and it was really was really participating. I mean, Brazil was um, it was created in the federal government a secretariat for for women issues, uh, and it was basically. And it's ba and people who is in, who are now in the federal government are pe people who were in the NGOs in the past. So it was really forming a a, a situation that uh, the social movement had the, the the support from the federal government. And 2004 was the peak of this movement. Uh, they discussed and 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 put forward a, a national plan of public po policies for women they created a consortium consortium of ngos and and the government and they discussed discussed a bill of law and this it was the law that after many discussion at many at many discussions two years of discussion is now the maria da penha law so this consortium presented the Bill of Law, and it was a hard discussion uh, and lobbying in the Congress and everything. Uh, but the government really put uh, 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 um, emphasis on this. Uh, on this bill of law to be approved in the Congress. And now we had, in 2007, we had again the second national conference and to discuss the scenario of implementation, implementation of the law. Because it's really what we are facing now is a very, um, <coughs> it's very worrying, worrying what's going on now because we, it's, it's been really um, slow the process of implementation of all we have in this law. So it's a very, it's, it was late. I mean, most of the countries started to have this, this laws, this legislation on domestic violence since the, 90, since, since the 90s. And we just, it was, we came to this very late, so only in 2006. But it's a very modern instrument. I mean, it's a very, it's, it's very comprehensive uh, and it has, Many kinds of of, of measures. They, it's not only punishment, but uh, assistance, uh, uh, emergency measures, prevention. Like they commit the the, the governments. They the, the law brings a, a specific commitment to state governments, municipalities, to say you have to create ed educational measures for against discrimination, uh, against uh, violence and everything. So it's a very comprehensive uh, statute. Uh, and it's very, it's one of the most modern statutes in Brazil regarding uh, the view of what is family, the view of what is, uh, what is considered and uh, what is accepted as, uh, as uh, for example, same-sex relationship. It's the only one. It's the only one. It's the legislation that expressly recognizes uh, same-sex relationship. Otherwise, we are not having this specifically recognized by law. We have been uh, recognizing same-sex relationship by the judiciary has been has been doing this, but not. We don't have a law instrument that formally. Uh, uh, recognizes that and we have this here we have also a uh, very different concept of family i mean we have the civil code had a very traditional concept of family and this is a a, a more uh, comprehensive uh, concept of family also recognizes that violence what was really a point that recognizes that violence against women can be it's not only physical violence it's also uh, psychological, moral, physical, and patrimonial damage. It's, it's a very a broad concept of violence. Uh, so it, it has a very, very, it's a very important statute in many points. Uh, but has a, one thing that I have, uh, it's the main point. Regarding criminal law, it's 
it's like what I'm saying about talking to you. It's very paradoxical how social movements are leading with criminal law. It's at the same time very modern instrument, but at the other hand, very conservative move, very conservative statute regarding criminal law. So created it created the the special court of domestic and family violence, uh, which was a very important demand from the social movement because I mean I think really it's all, I think here is all, all it happens in many countries. Women have a problem in the family; they have to search for the civil uh, in the civil uh, in the civil courts to try to solve the problem to about the divorce. Uh, about the children and then go to the police station the system is not communicate there is not a, it's, a, it's the same situation but they, she has to to go to different organs to different uh, to, to have different process to address the situation so this they, they created the the special courts of domestic and family and family violence that would be uh, civil and penal competence and penal competence together and also responsible for the urgent measures, assistance, orientation, there would be, it's a multi, it, it, in, the, in the paper, it, it, uh, it uh, says it, it should have multidisciplinary staff, like psych, psych, psychologists, health, uh, people from the health field, and, and also, uh, uh, it would be linked to a network of assistance, like um, shelters, reference centers, health centers, specific for women. I mean, in the paper, it's really a very, uh, it's a very strong, it could be a very strong in instrument to, to address the problem. Um, it's urgent measures of, uh, was also a very important uh, a very important uh, thing in the in the in the statute, like they were before the law, there were no no such a thing. The, the only thing that could happen was um, in the eighties, the man could be arrested. In the nineties, I'll talk why, why the man could not even be arrested, and there was nothing more, nothing else to be done. No urgent, no no urgent measures to protect a woman. So the, the law uh, uh, settles a lot of uh, many different um, measures, urgent measures, like suspense, suspension of the aggressor's license to carry a weapon, uh, remove them from home, uh, obligation to keep distance from the family, for the children, for the woman. Uh, and in this law, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's uh, uh, stated that he can also be arrested. And also very comprehensive, for example, guarantees like oblige uh, public and private uh, and private uh, um, how do we say? Empregadores? Uh, employers. employers, sorry. Public and private employers to uh, accept that the women can be out of their jobs for up to six months if they are in this situation. I mean, it's a very comprehensive instrument. It was really, and it was really, I think it was like this because it was really discussed uh, for like four years of discussion with many NGOs, with many people from the social movement, with many women were heard. But it was also, um, it also brings maybe a sense of revenge. It also brings this very, this bitter um, taste of revenge and we can see this in the criminalization uh, issue. Um, like just to, ah, the, the law is very also like, in the law we have the obligation of the, of, we have, the law obliges the government to create inclusive uh, observatories to monitor this, its application. I mean, it really, really embraces a lot of things. But uh, regarding the criminalization, 
it still sees the criminalization and incarceration as the most important means to confront domestic violence. And I'll, I'll bring the criminalization issue. I'll explain why it was it has been a problem and, and it, why it has been uh, so important to the social movement to make a point on the criminalization. In, in we had this this law. 1999 law. It was a law of the the statute 19. Um, it was a law that instituted the special criminal courts. Uh, it's a general law for criminal cases for what we call minor offensive uh, cri crimes for minor offense offensive potential, which 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 are all the crimes that the maximum sentence. Uh, stipulated are not up to two years. So all the cases that that uh, the maximum penalty stipulated are not up to two years goes to this special court and also a special proceeding different from the traditional criminal law procedure. I mean we have something very different from here in Brazil which is the legality principle. I mean there's no such a thing there, was, there has been no such a thing like plea bargaining or negotiating the, the, the negotiating with prosecutors. Uh, I mean, if there is a crime and there are evidences, prosec the prosecutor must process, must go on in any, any situation. So it was a, a, a mark in the, in the criminal law field. This, uh, the, the, the enactment of this law. And it was thought as um, it was a very uh, long debate to accept this, this law in the, criminal, in, the, in the criminal law field be exactly because of this, because we don't have the tradition to have negotiations between uh, prosecutor and, and, and of offender and we don't have the tradition to have the victim in the in the in the criminal procedure. That was important. That was an important point. One of the arguments to this to this law was the victim is normally very. Uh, it's not. Uh, nobody cares for the victim in the criminal in the criminal procedure. Like the victim, the victim is put aside, and it's just a matter of how much. Pun it's a just just a matter of punishment. Uh, it's just the prosecutor and the judge asserting what what kind of punishment punishment the the offender will will get. So it was, it was strangely it was also a law fought to address the victim because it it uh, brings the possibility of conciliate conciliation. There is this what we call the preliminary before the case to go on. There is what we call the preliminary uh, hearing where we have, first of all, the possibility of conciliation between conciliation or mediation between author and victim. And if it doesn't go right, then we have the negotiation with the public prosecutor and before the criminal, the criminal case starts. There is a negotiation like, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a plea bargaining. Uh, but there's the, it cannot involve uh, imprisonment. So the, the offender can accept uh, a measure, a no, imprison, no imprisonment uh, penalty before, if, before the, the case will go on uh, and, and the case is just dropped because he has set uh, uh, to receive um, a no incarceration uh, penalty. And the third thing is, if the case, if there is, if this negotiation do, doesn't work, there is still the possibility of the suspension of the case. What that is, the case is initiated by the prosecutor, and under and it can be suspended from two up to four years under certain certain conditions. So the the offender, the accused, uh, accept some conditions that is established by the judge that can be I can go to the I go to the judge every month to say what I'm doing uh, I I recover the I recover the the damage I go to uh, into a, a, 
a workshop specific to address the, the, the violence I committed. I mean, the, the conditions, the, there is some flexibility for the judge to fix this kind, the, we, under which conditions the process will be suspended if he breaks the process uh, goals uh, normally. Uh, so it was also uh, something that was brought with, with this law. But it was not thought to address domestic violence, and it was not, and it was applied, and it was applied, it was this law that was applied uh, to domestic violence cases, because personal and body injuries and threats that were, that were the, most, uh, the most common cases of domestic violence were uh, under this, this law. And also under this law, there is no, there's no possibility of um, prison in flagrant act. Do we say it like this? Prison in flagrant act and, and custody prison. The cases under this law, as, as it's a law for, it's a, a law for to be, alter, to, to establish alternative to incarceration. Mm -hmm. It was also, it also prohibits uh, the, this, the custody prison or prison in flagrant act. So cases, from the 90s, we have the, the what I said, this, the, the era of the, the special police station in the 80s. In the, and in the 90s, we had uh, all the domestic violence cases being uh, dealt under this, uh, this law. And the result was very, very disappointing for all the feminists. And they were right to be disappointed, because uh, what happened was that for for a judge that was dealing, it was a judge that was dealing with really dealing with many cases that were not really not paying attention to the to the cases of the of the women. There was a very strong culture of this is a this is something this is an unimportant thing. So the conciliations we have a lot of research. We, we had a lot, of, not, not a lot of research, no, we don't have a lot of research, but we have some research that uh, heard women that said, I was, I, the concili they, 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 they didn't even want to find the conciliation because it, they were, they, they had so many cases to be solved in the day that the preliminary hearing was like direct to the point, they didn't want to hear me. They were assuming that conciliation was not, a, or mediation was not, or is not possible. They went directly to the same, to the to the second step, which is negotiation with the prosecutor. And in this negotiation with the prosecutor, it was like, oh, that is a petty thing. That was not done an important thing. Uh, then what he established as the no incarceration penalty to drop the case was um, uh, insignificant fine or what was uh, really stuck in the imaginary of all Brazilian women was the, the what we call cesta basica, what was a basket of goods. So you pay a basket of goods, one or two, to a, a charity institution, and that is the, the, the penalty you receive, the case is dropped. So it was really a, a, a tragedy to, to deal with domestic violence cases, because it was uh, all these instruments uh, that could be used uh, more adequately to address specifically the, the cases of the women, like the conciliation and the mediation could be an instrument, but were applied by a non-specialized staff. It was like, like lost in the middle of the many other criminal cases, and it did, just didn't work. So, it was really considered a uh, trivialization of violence against women. And also, there was, there was first a symbolic thing, very important to the move movement, a symbolic, a symbolic statement that it's, it, cannot com it cannot be considered a minor, a, a crime of minor offensive potential. This was, was a point. But the second point was the most important one. They are really thing everybody is, is feeling uh, that what we got is impunity. We interviewed um, the congresswoman who was who who formally 
uh, wrote the the bill of law of Maria da Penha, Jandira Fegali, and she was saying when we analyze 10 years of functioning of the special courts, we see that the results in reinforce impunity, giving path to reincidence and aggravation of the violence. 90% of the cases are dismissed or end up in negotiation with the public prosecutor. And the ministry, Nusea Freire, what she was in the Secretariat for, for Women Issues, uh, she also makes a point in this, in this question. For me, impunity was associated to two things. First, there was no commitment from Brazilian state government to fight domestic violence. And, this, and it was totally right. Like before Maria da Penha law, there was no such a thing like a, a national politics against uh, domestic violence. So the scenario, in the scenario can be divided in two eras, <laughs> before and after Maria da Penha law. And I think she's really totally right. Um, because what's the first moment? The first moment that um, the gov the state, the Brazilian state, was formally committed to uh, do something to address the problem. But the second thing uh, that that gave all all the 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 sense of impunity was really the, according to to the ministry, the penalties applied. More than the morosity, the question that remained in the imaginary of the people was the basket of goods associated to the alternative penance. So the general feeling was you just pay a, a, a basket of goods and you get rid of the thing and you go back and you, you do everything again. But what was not... So that's why uh, in the discussion of the Maria da Penha law, uh, to block, to block the application of the alternatives was such a strong point. The discussion was made like in a very, it was made like this, no, we don't, we don't want this. And maybe what, was, what we needed at the moment was to think, what's going on with this that maybe it's not being applied well by the institutions. Maybe we have to develop institutions to, maybe it was not a problem of the law, maybe the instruments of mediation and suspension of the process and everything could be an instrument to address the problem of domestic violence, could be an instrument to uh, stop the, the, cycle, the cycle of violence. But at the moment of the law, the, the, the discussion was not addressed in this way. It was like for 10 years of this feeling of impunity, the only thing that the women wanted wanted to say is, we don't want this law, we don't want this thing of paying a basket of good again, we don't want alternatives at all, we want incarceration. And that was uh, the main point, I mean the main resist resistance when we were discussing, I was, I was telling we had a long process of lobbying because in, in favor of this law, and this point was a very strong point of resistance, like why not apply the, the alternatives, why to have the exception for men, and it was very difficult to to pass this specific point because it suffered the it was the the it, it, it suffered the resistance from not only from uh, con men, congressmen that were saying this is the discriminates against men, but also from uh, part of a small part of the feminist movement that said but incarceration is not a good solution as well. So this was the main difficult, to, difficult and the main controversy during the process of applying the law, of, of building the law. And it is still the main point, uh, in the, pro the main point now, uh, the main controversy in enforcing the law. I'll just talk, to this in a moment, talk about this in a moment. So what the law says is that uh, removes totally the competence of these courts, though we don't have the possibility of conciliation, mediation, negotiation with the prosecutor, or suspension of the process. Also, it's automatic criminalization because before uh, the um, physical injuries, any physical injuries, what, something that this law did, did was any physical injuries uh, that was not uh, 
very serious, that means not, not serious injuries, that not uh, leave any, any definitive damage to a person, is subjected to uh, the decision of the victim to go on or not in the process. So like car, accidents, everything like this, they were one of the things that this law did or is uh, this kind of thing is, is the decision of the victim, victim because we want that in these situations maybe conciliation, mediate, conciliation is a good, it's a good deal for the victim. Uh, so in, with the Maria de Peña law, uh, this, this was ruled out automatic criminalization of acts involving physical injury. That means the victim has not, no choice. Prosecutor must go on, even if the victim doesn't want. Uh, so we didn't have any alternatives. Uh, allows the prison and is, uh, expressly forbids pecuniary sentences and basket of goods. Like basket of goods was word in the <laughs> everybody was so traumatized with this experience that was written in the law. Uh, so we have we can from the feminist debate we bring a lot of discussion about this. We can we can talk about this later. First, uh, the discussion and the critics that it completely takes the autonomy of the woman to decide what to do in the case. Uh, of course, we recognize that better women are in a special condition that have to receive uh, support to be, in a, to be in, in, in a position, to be strong enough to uh, make this decision freely, uh, to, to sit in front of the aggressor and, and, make, and make the point of what I want to, to, to drop the charge, to conciliate or mediate or to solve the situation. But uh, it's it's a it's very it's a challenging to have conciliation mediation in this kind of 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 problem. But the law just takes out completely the autonomy of of women. Uh, it's also said that it's case, there are normally cases of high uh, degree of complexity, like the violence is a result of inequalities that's going on in the in this couple for for years, and to build a solution, a solution has to be uh, a solution to this case is much more complex than just uh, punishment and incarceration. Only after the whole case. So there is also no, and also the punishment, punishment only in the end of the process is said to be kind of inefficient because, and, and many, many people put, uh, make the point that some instruments like the, the possibility of being, of, of being uh, charged and the possibility of having the, the, the process, sus the suspension of the process and the, if he comes back and do it again, the process will start over again. I mean, some of the instruments that from the previous law that were uh, the alternative instruments, if they were, if they were used uh, or if they were applied in by uh, uh, trained staff, by by prosecutors and judges that were really thinking about the situation of the woman, they, would, they could help more than just punishment in the end of the criminal case. So we interviewed, uh, uh, we interviewed a judge that uh, it's, a, it's a judge from, uh, of one of these, it's a woman, a woman uh, she works, she's a judge from one of these domestic violence uh, courts and she deliberately uh, doesn't obey the law and she applies the suspension of the process. She says, no, I, I know the law forbids the suspension of the process, but I think it's the most, in, most interesting uh, mechanism to make the, the cycle of violence to stop because the aggressor has the, 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 the cases, the criminal case is suspended. If he does it again, the cases comes back and he has two cases. So I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm applying the, the suspension of the case even against the law. 
and because I because I think that this is this works much more than just go on with the go on with the criminal case and in the end the husband or the partner gets gets a punishment this doesn't doesn't uh, solve the, the problem of the of the woman um, and I mean many and many uh, many people says that maybe the possibility to the possibility to choose uh, there is an, uh, uh, there is a research that interviewed many women and and were uh, concluding that many women used they, they didn't think that not pressing the charge was submission or or uh, not being strong enough to do it or being afraid. Many women used the, the thing because we had this uh, in the discussion sometimes we can feel I cannot go into details here but some, sometimes we can feel um, that feminine, most of the feminism feminist, uh, most of the feminisms feminists uh, like reificate the woman in the position of the victim mm -hmm. and as and we see evidence that it's it's not like this many women were not pressing charges because they were using the the possibility of press charge or not as an instrument to negotiate their situation with their husbands mm -hmm. so and like avoiding the 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 alternatives avoiding all these things were also like uh, uh, I don't know if you have this expression in English, but we say in Portuguese, we shot our own feet. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> we are shooting our own feet because they are like uh, trying to protect the woman and, like, and at the same time just fix the woman in this fragile position of not being able to deal the, 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 with the situation. Just you, be, you are a victim, you be a part of the process, we, the prosecutor and the state, we we go on with the thing. We decide if we press charge or not. We decide. We we, we don't we don't have, we we go until we go until the end until the punishment and they we, they just take the woman uh, away uh, and take the power of the woman to uh, to be uh, active actor of the solving of this of of her own situation. So this is some of the the critics. Uh, we we do about this uh, strong point on uh, criminal process and punishment and incarceration and also this general feeling that we see in the social movement you see also in the in the in the AI yeah, saw also in the black movement the Brazilian black, mo black movement that uh, this mixing recognition through punishment if you have a very, very serious punishment, the more we punish, the more large are the sentence, the more recognized we are. So you, we are really bringing this, I am really bringing, some people are really bringing this question, what if, if we really can address, we really can get recognition through punishment. The scenario of implement, I'm almost running out of time, or I have no, no time at all. But the scenario of implementation is uh, what we, we see in Brazil nowadays are mo a very strong resistance to the law, mostly because of this, what I said, criminal issue. So in the police stations, what you see in the police stations is that they are still trying to to conciliate, and because of because there is no further alternative, because uh, it's very uh, if we start, you go all the way, and and it's a harsh way, and it's a hard, and can be a harsh result. There's the police stations are still doing trying to do uh, conciliations between author and, and victim, and they are of course doing in the worst way possible. Like this is nothing. Go home and be together, and they are not. They are not prepared to do that. So it's still going on, and it's it's going on in the worst way it could be. Uh, 
We have also resistance in the judiciary. This is a very, um, a very delicate moment uh, about this law because in the first moment we had a strong resistance that judge just saying, I'm not applying this law because it discriminates against men. Because we, uh, I'm, I'm okay that we had a, a, a legislation against domestic violence, but anybody can be victim of domestic violence, and this is domestic violence, violence only for women. It discriminates against men. It was, we had some uh, reactions uh, going in this direction, and it's over now. It was very punctual. Some judges, and they, had, they got disciplinary uh, process and everything. It was very mach machista, how do you say it? Machista, point, ma points of view that are eliminated. But what we do have as a resistance now are judges that recognize the importance of the law, but simply doesn't apply the point of the blocking of the alternatives. I recognize the law, but I, I don't agree with this point, either because I think there is no point on blocking this alternatives, because the alternatives was, was something that the, the law of 1995 was in, the, in our constitution <coughs> since 88. So the law from 1995 was regulation, uh, a provision in our constitution. And he says there is no point of making an exception. It's, it's anti-constitutional to make the, the exception for, for the case for men for this particular crime. I'm not applying the, this, particular, the, this particular article because it's against the Constitution. The Constitution said crimes up to this point will have alternative and I'm not applying, I'm not agreeing on this. And also judge that like this that we interviewed said, I just think the this is a very good solution for the case. I just, I, I just think that conciliation and sometimes conciliation, sometimes suspension of the process are good solutions to the case. So I apply the law mm. even though. So there is a lot of uncertainty. There are so many uncertainties nowadays going on uh, of what is happening to the, or in, the implementing, in the enforcement of this law that it came to a point that we have in Brazil this instrument. It's called, uh, it's an, an action that the president himself starts in the Supreme Court to get a declaration of the Supreme Court that this law is constitutional. So the uncertainty is so huge that the president, President Lula, did this action to, in the Supreme, of course, supported by the uh, 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 Secretary of Public, Secretariat for Public Policy Women. They did this uh, action in the Supreme Court to get the formal uh, statement from the Supreme Court to say this law is, co is according to the Constitution. It, was, it's not, it, it has not been judged yet. So we have a big scenario of uncertainty about uh, the enforcement of this law. And yeah, uh, what we have, in, and also the second point is, uh, of course, the structural point. I mean, the first difficulty is the resistance in judiciary in the in the police stations but we have a, we face we have this general feeling that the law is just not being applied because of the institutional background we are very uh, late in building the institutional background to really have this law applied because it's very in the pa on the paper it's very very modern it it brings a lot of innovative and very important uh, innovations but we just since 2006 until now we are very 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 slow in the institutional conditions to have this this law applied so um, one thing is that. 
one thing is that it's a federal law and it depends on police stations, it depends on the organization of the judiciary, which is a state issue. So the creation of specialized uh, uh, police stations, the creation of specialized courts are a state issue and it's, it's getting really slow. Uh, also, all the, the network of assistance like health, psychological, all the network of assistance also depends, many times depends on the uh, municipalities and it's also going very, very slow. So what we have in Brazil that we have is a very, very, very uneven local policies. And even in, in Sao Paulo, which is uh, the biggest state, we just had the first court, the, sh the first specialized court in 2009. I mean, the law is, has passed in 2006, and we had the first one in 2009. And it's been, uh, we have, it's very, very insufficient. I mean, the police stations, police stations are very important to, to the case, a very important institution to, to, to deal with the case of domestic violence because it's the first place a woman uh, search. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is to search a police station. Uh, we have a very insufficient number of, of the special units for women and the law also gives a lot of important, importance to the police stations. The police stations have a role, according to the law, a very important role to uh, like the first, it's the entry aid to the woman to the protection, to the, to the whole system of protection. So supposedly the police station will, would give all the information, all the orientation for this woman and the, in the police station, the, in the police station it would be uh, seeing if she needs an uh, urgent measure and then sh the police station would, would uh, ask the judge for an urgent measure and and, all if, and also if she needs assistance of psychological assistance and everything. I mean, in the, in the law, according to the law, this multi multidisciplinary staff would be present in the police station, what is not happening. We have here some, uh, I think these three statements of three women are, gives a, a, a panorama of what's happening in the police station. First, I wish that they had listened to me. I did not say anything. I spoke the, basic, the basics and gone. I pressed a charge and I spoke about the threat. Nobody knows the story. I wanted to have protection. They told me that he will be investigated and then the process will, the process will happen. What we see here is that police stations are, are just working as they usually work on, on normal crimes. Like, you, pre you, you go there and they, they will investigate. Like, they're not they're not caring about orientation or, or urgent measures. They're just not, they're really, they are really leaving the, the women helpless as, as always. Until then he'll kill me. They feel the complaint. I said that he's threatened me and that's all. Should have told them that he tried to kill me once, but I was not supposed to talk about it. It was told that the complaint only addresses what happened at this time. I was told to seek a lawyer to go to the children's court, basic, because I had a son with him and I need the custody of the child. And that's why so many women are dying, so it's so slow. Oh, I mean, this, would, this could not happen. This happened in a specialized police station. And then can, and we don't have these units we don't have enough specialized police stations in Brazil. You can imagine what it's like to be in a normal police station. I mean, this could never happen under the Maria da Penha law because this woman should get all the assistance, all the orientation she, she needed in the police station. So, and they are working like normal police stations, like just we investigate the crime and send to the prosecutor to, be, to, to see if we have a, we have a case. I did not feel very welcome nor, nor very comfortable to say all I had to say. I was ex expecting a service with more explanation, different from those we are using in other common precincts. I wanted to explain to them that this is a dangerous man, 
He was at my house on Sunday. I took my washing machine to seven by drugs. And when I reacted, he said he would, he would kill me. Do you understand? They did, they did not understand that. Do they think he'll, he'll, leave, he'll leave me alone until September? I'm disappointed. Because here they just set an appointment to September, like three months ahead, what was, what was the case when the woman seeked for help. And this last one is even worse because the woman was just uh, counseled not to, to register the complaint. It's been a year since I first came, but I did not register the complaint. I just heard the, the advice of the guy who assisted me, who assisted me. He said it was not a serious case that needed to be recorded, but this time I did it. I mean, this is happening in the specialized police. And what's sad, uh, what we, we have heard, we, we, we did a lot, uh, we did some uh, field research, and what we heard is that being in a specialized police uh, for women is like, uh, it's like, a disgrace in a career. It's like if you are, if you want to be punishment in the career of a policeman, in the police, you go to this police station. So you can imagine what kind of people are there. They are really not caring about. And so we 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 are not getting to the point that we have all the specialized assistants, all the specialized staff, and everything. So police, they they we don't have enough police specialized police stations, and they are working like this. And the courts are also, the, the courts are um, being created, the special courts are being created in a very slow pace. Uh, and the transition is that they have to be, the cases are, they, ha they function together with the criminal, uh, in the criminal court. That's why the cases are just being dealt according to the, to the legislation of 95. People, it's the it's the same it's the same situation. I, I mean, there there is there are a lot of cases in the middle of these different cases. There is a case of of domestic violence is just treated a, a, a normal uh, criminal case, and that's why judges are are just not following, not applying the law, and make in, in doing the conciliation and negotiation with the prosecutor in the worst way, like not in the not in the way that ah this we try to build a solution in the best way for the for to address the case they are doing this in the worst way, and I mean the network assistance is also very uh, it's not consolidated and even in the in the states that we in the cities that we had the the, um, the shelters we have health centers or reference centers they don't communicate with each other I mean. The shell, people in the shelter doesn't know nothing about the about the the criminal the case in the judiciary. They just don't communicate. So it's very, it's a very worrying scenario of implementation of the law, and it's um, and what we see now is that it's 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 being everybody sees that it's what's going on, and. The government created this observatory for monitoring the implementation. It was in the, it was, uh, it's a provision for in the law, and it was created. It started to do a lot of research in how what's going on in the implement, implementation of of the law. Um, there was that just happened, just happened. This uh, national pact from Kombeikov against violence against women, which was like a pact between federal government and state governments uh, with strong financial support from the federal government to try to finally in implement the institutions. So it's, let's see what, what's going on uh, about this. But with uh, what comes to, to my central point, it's, which is to discuss if if the law is uh, with this strong point in the criminalization and punishment and so on, and discuss and the discussion about the possible alternatives, in the middle of all this uncertainty, there is no room to to rediscuss the law, and that's what I think it's a, it's a pity, because uh, we are just losing the opportunity to discuss a different agenda 
uh, that is not punishment, that is not incarceration, and that could be could address the problem of domestic violence better than punishment and incarceration. So this is more or less like what we have in Brazil. And the and the and the, and the action in the Supreme Court was not judged yet. So we are still waiting for uh, for an answer. But it's like, of course. And, and what we have is that maybe this to to bring the it's it's, it's difficult as um, in this role of of course uh, research and and militants in favor of and feminist milit militants we we are I am in a like strange situation also because I want to bring these questions to the law I I don't agree with with with. For example, this point, this strong point in criminalization. But <laughs> if we do this point too strong, we, we end up like weakening the law. So there is little space for, for bringing the discussion again in the public sphere, because we are trying to uh, save the law and save the good aspects of the law. So it was really, uh, yeah, it was, the debate was not was maybe conducted in a in a rush and with this very strong feeling of impunity and it get, and made the law go out like this and what we have here and what's trying to it's a, the difficult now is try to address the problem without weakening the law it's a very difficult situation i mean that's it i mean we can we can it's the scenario Thank you. So, if you have impressions, questions, or advices, I would be. I'm really interested in the implementation. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Rio, and I was really interested in the distribution of these kinds of uh, news stations, especially in areas with more violence, be it drug violence or other places. And also, um, coming from a health professional background, I was interested in whether there's been any talk of integrating the police station things that go to social familia and like the public health units to offer psychological and medical support because those have strong community presences. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I think about the which police we got, it's never inside a community. It's always outside. There's no integration of a, of a formal police infrastructure inside high-risk communities. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, with the lack of integration between the state public health apparatus and the state um, legal apparatus, there's no integration there. And then the, the police station also cannot physically be inside mm -hmm. these high-risk communities, coupled by the fact that I don't know if any of these police officers are women. What, is the poss what are the chances of, of access for the populations that need the most? And are there opportunities for them to get health services? It sounds really bleak. It sounds kind of depressing. Yeah. Is that? Yeah, it's a very difficult situation. In this case, what we bring is that um, it makes the situation even worse because we have this intersectionality between uh, the many kinds of discrimination and the problem in the in the in the and the, the in the favelas. Yeah, you're totally right. You just don't have any. So far, any hope to like the what we have now, the uh, UPPs, the the it's no way thinking about it. It's far away to think about the situation of the woman. Mm -hmm. So this kind of integration is just not happening. In, it's not even in the in the agenda. It's <coughs> very. Do you think it's? Uh, do you think there's any change? I was just looking at this picture of Michelle Bachelet. Like, if Gioma has the capacity to be the sort of transformational woman leader in Brazil that Bachelet was in Chile in terms of women's rights. I think we have a very. I think w what we have since 2004 and with the Maria da Penha law, it's uh, we really had um, uh, uh, a space in the public debate to talk about about the the subject so it was it was important to bring the subject the subject up and 
but what but it's still it doesn't mean exactly that women knows the that women know the rights and they know what to do and that it's really and things are really working it's i i, I think we had the the, the Maria da Penha brought the, the subject up. It's an impression. I don't have numbers, but it doesn't mean that women are more uh, aware of rights or or everything. Because it's like Maria da Penha. Now, now, Maria, now we have this law, so now we can be really harsh for you. I mean, maybe the the criminal law thing, the criminal law issue, just work it for for this like to to have this symbolic uh, presence in the in the relations in the public debate so now it's very harsh if you if you be a woman now it's now you really have you really get punished but like in the long run if it doesn't work like it we came to the to the same scenario of impunity <coughs> like it's, it's maybe it's just a momentaneous uh, strength for women, but after years of things are just not working, and things are just working as they used to, conciliation in the police station and so on, it, we just came to the same scenario of impunity. We're really, we're not, we're using the criminal law like a symbolic thing, or like Judge Butler says, the, the follows that of the state that comes to solve the thing, but uh, we are really not addressing the, the, the situation. I think maybe you suggested this, but have you heard that there have been more incarcerations as a result of the Maria Pena law? Is that something that you no. can know? Uh, we, we don't um we don't know. Uh, we don't know yet because we don't know. This is something also difficult. The, the, um, in Brazil, research in the in the justice system, because the data is just not. Uh, it's not. It's the database is just not prepared to be researched. The database is built to lawyers. So if you have a number of the process, you go there and you find your case. If but if you want to research cases of domestic violence, you cannot do research. So we are starting to, we are starting to do research on, uh, I am working, I am working in a, finishing a research on all the cases in the second instance, because what we have is, uh, in the first instance, we cannot at all assess the database. In the tribunals, like second instance, appeal courts, we can, kind of access a database uh, if we go, if we, if we ask for subjects. It's not complete, but I mean, we can kind of access because they are not complete. Like the appeal courts, they, they have a database, a public database, and we can, you can search through keywords, but we cannot, but it's not complete. What I'm doing now in Brazil is with a group, with, with, a, with a group in the, um, in the research uh, in Sebrap, this, this research institution, is to, res to see all the cases uh, judged under Maria da Penha law uh, in nine federal states. And we're just finishing this, this research. And there have been, it's an it's a, it's a impression, we are not, uh, we, we didn't finish yet, so I'm talking about impression, not being very academic now. But the impression, the impression we have is that there have been many arrests, uh, uh, preventive arrests and custody arrests, but, um, but um, in the, many cases just don't get to, an, to, a, to a sentence. They are dropped in the middle for for procedural, procedural issues, issues or, and in the end, you have, we have a, we can have an alternative of to no incarceration. So I don't think it really, in, it really increases the incarceration number in terms of final sentence, but, but mostly in these preventive arrests. But even though Brazilian, 
population in the in prison population is half 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 final sentence half uh, pre preventive custody. So that that has been a, that can be something. But what we hear for people who is trying to assess some way uh, the first instance is that most of the cases are being resolved with the uh, the law of the special courts, the old law, in the worst way. Because conciliations, women not being heard, conciliations not well done, and baskets of goods and all, everything. So I mean, I don't think it, I think most of the cases, although I'm not researching the first instance, I'm researching only the appeal courts, in the appeal court, so what I heard from people who is trying to assess the first instance, and also with with some interviews with judges, is that the cases are being this, we have the same situations as in the 90s. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, talking about the um, controversy among feminists as to this criminalization approach, can you say something about how you might distinguish those who are more pro-criminalization and those that are either against or at least very ambivalent about it? Uh, if I can, I, I, I would say in Brazil we have 90-90% of feminists in favor of criminalization. And it's really very difficult to bring the point. Uh, did you say 99%? Yeah, I would, I, I say, I'm saying Sorry, randomly. 1%. <laughs> oh, I would yeah. say you, you are just hated if you bring this point. Yeah, we, we have a kind of similar situation here in the US. Really? Yeah, so we, we can, we can, you can make an analysis. So, <laughs> against, uh, it's a little bit stronger since about 2000. But, so there are very, very few. That very, very few. Very, very, very few. I mean, you, you, you can be hated. I, I was, I was, I am in. A, I am now, have facing a hard time to write the article about this, uh, like saying, uh, not. Uh, maybe it's something that it's a discussion. I can understand. I'm, I'm really having a hard time trying to not. Uh, trying to not destroy the channel of, of dialogue with the feminists. Because uh, it seems to be, ha I mean, it, if, you, if you come to, the, to this idea against criminalization, you're just, I don't want to hear you. So I'm trying to, uh, to address the thing like, uh, maybe in the moment of the law it was an important point, but maybe, but we just cannot drop the, the, the discussion about the alternative, so maybe it's, we, can, we can bring again the subject and start again uh, talking about no incarceration and punishment, etc. But I'm really, I'm really having a hard time because you're just, uh, what, what, what is happening, it's so strong that many judges that are, uh, all the position against uh, criminalization or against the the block of the alternatives are labeled as machistas and for for judges that are men and they do, just don't care about women's problem and so on. So it's there is in Brazil in the feminist movement in Brazil it, this discussion is just doesn't exist. I just wanted to say this is more of a comment. I thought it was really interesting the idea that you're talking about that in the police and in like male police world that working in one of these special police stations is considered an embarrassment. You only send your worst people there and that to me sounds like a really crucial part of this problem is how do you even begin to solve it if you're not putting your best resources. The people yeah. working there are reluctant. Um, yeah, they're not I, proud of what they do. It's not considered a real problem. I mean, where do you even begin to address that? Yeah, yeah it's really, there's, there's no institutional support. That, that's really, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a real problem, the institutions. I mean, we, have, we can bring the, the question of criminalization and think about and discuss the law, but what's, what's happening in the police station is it's just the worst scenario. It's really a scenario. As it's we had, it's a very 
it's it's very frustrating because we have uh, we had since 2006 this this legislation and things are just going more or less the same way just happening the same way although there is a very strong commitment from the federal government putting money and putting uh, and trying to and also now with this national pack let's see what's what's going on but I mean this the the has to come together with uh, an institutional support an institutional process of training people training staff or something like that because we had like since the we had we have now 450 uh, specialized police station which is nothing in, if you think about a, a country uh, in as huge as Brazil but the, the federal the federal money has been going to to create the units but the units are just wor working like that the same just a normal and maybe even worse than a normal as, as a normal police station oh, and that's not close to normal I, in, in March uh, last year I was uh, visiting uh, one of the special uh, police stations and it was dismal and uh, I, um, in order to get there, I had to keep asking all these other police stations they were operating full force. In Brazil? Uh, yeah, oh, okay. In Paulo, oh, okay. I, uh, granted, I only been very briefly just, you know, um, to get uh, some information. And uh, like you mentioned in the uh, earlier uh, notes, that um, non-trained staff, very hostile. There were women sitting there, and there was no brochures. Yeah. It looked like just like one of those uh, health clinics as you walk in. A really ugly, really a small room, barely able to sit. You know, yeah. six women, and then um, the doors are closed, and the one attendant and the supervisor wouldn't allow me to even seek information. And when um, and she said, I have to make an appointment down, you know, I, a week from now, whatever, uh, we don't have time for you. But all the women there were not treated very well. To get there, it took me forever to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a small place and very little money. So if yeah. the federal government is investing on, on these stations, what's, um, where is it going? Because, yeah. yeah <laughs> you're, no thank you for contributing to the, to, the, to the picture. It's exactly like this. Yeah. This, uh, this discussion to us is very important because w we've been in the field of violence against women for over 20 years and uh, we think it went really bad the mm -hmm. way it is, it is right now. And as uh, some of the arguments you brought is really close to us personally about um, you know, the, the taking the, the power away from the women, the decision making, the mandatory arrests that have a, um, a fired back, the, especially immigrant communities, and the, you know, uh, there are unintended consequences that are just dire, and the families apart, and losing the custody of the children. Mm -hmm. I work on daily basis on this issue, but what I didn't want to see is uh, the same route that we took here yeah. is going there. I'm only about to say yeah. that, uh, Martha, uh, really quick. I think that one thing that also we, we miss a little bit is that the, the recognition of the issue of domestic violence in Brazil started five years ago, four years ago. We have been going on that here in America for a very long time. And what we have here in America, in most of the police departments, so it's called the domestic violence units. They have a, a uh, uh, a unit designed in order to deal with, with matters related to domestic violence. And some police department, most of the police departments, uh, especially in California, uh, I will not generalize, but we have the uh, sexual assault units, we have DV units, and so forth. And so those are, usually they have advocates from, from um, grassroots organizations, such as domestic violence organizations, local domestic violence organizations. So they have the advocates, they have investigators who are uh, train uh, in order to deal with the issues of DV. Um, so there is, you know, there is a resource and there are organizations which are focused in dealing with this issue. But this did not start five years ago. The move, domestic violence movement in America started 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So what we see here is a really, uh, uh, is a, a juvenile kind of a uh, process happening in Brazil. 
And, uh, and just for you to know that here in American stuff, we have a lot of problems, as she just has stated. Uh, you know, it, things are here are not perfect mm -hmm. at all. You know, uh, and I think that one of the things that you touch bases upon was on the issue of the, the punishment in which you are, are against it, and in many levels I'm also against it. I think that what Brazil has been doing for the last eight years or so is adopting a lot of the policies uh, in how we deal with punishment in America. Mm -hmm. You know, we come from a culture, America is a culture of a heavy punishment. There is nothing in between. And that when you introduce this level of, of, uh, of uh, philosophy to a culture, they are so heavily on Christianity. They are a culture that is so into, you know, uh, has undermined the rights of women for so long. And all of a sudden, you just threw right on the faces this level of punishment against their providers when women is under such a, a, a marginalized social economic status, uh, I can see that being as a, as a major problem. Mm -hmm. So it's something you know something that you kind of needed to balance. Uh, um, yes, the sounds of the punishment uh, the punishment sounds very good, uh, but also you needed to have a, a, a be very uh, sensitive towards the fact that, that uh, we're dealing with the culture of the women. Uh, we're dealing with a uh, society in which has never before, mm -hmm. until five years ago, talked about issues of women, rights of women, the status of women. And uh, so that is something that uh, to think about. It. Yeah. I think I, again. I'm sorry to break this up, but unfortunately we're actually out of time. I wanted to first thank uh, Martha again very much for her presentation, and I hope that all of you who are very interested in her topic can talk to her after the talk and maybe exchange yeah. information. I'm sure you'll all be Thank, thank you very much for all the comments. Thank you.